What's up you guys? Welcome back. If you are new, my name is Jess. I'm a recovering addict who served time in prison and I'm here with Ryan Leone who has the craziest story. I don't even know if we have time to get through it all, but we're gonna try. Let's try. He's the author of a best-selling novel and so much more. So without further ado, let's just jump right into it today. So I guess the first question I have for you is where your addiction started. Um, my addiction started probably like most people's. My addiction started when I was in high school. So I, I don't think, I think I, I tried smoking weed for the first time when I was nine. I used to hang out with older skateboarding kids in the neighborhood. And I thought it'd be funny to get me stoned, have me hit a blunt when I was like nine. That's really young. Yeah, I turned out fine. So, <laughs> you know, but um, basically when it got problematic for me was when I was 15 and I, you know I went to high school I, I got into all the PG-13 stuff started smoking herb all the time I started drinking dropping acid mushrooms I got expelled from three schools within the span of one month and my parents were perplexed I changed it was a pretty radical departure from how I was before I entered high school I'd gone to a private middle school for a few years, and then when I went to public high school, all you know, all hell broke loose. And so my parents sent me to programs for troubled adolescents when I was 15. Um, I went to Idaho to a wilderness program, and then I went to Utah for like a long-term residential treatment center. When I got out of that, I think I was gone for like nine months. When I got out of that, somebody introduced me to cocaine, and that was. I was 16 at the time, and that was like my first love. And then I started smoking black tar heroin maybe within a year of that. Um, back to the place in Utah, my parents ended up giving up custody me for a while. I went to an orphanage for like a couple weeks, which was weird at like 17. I was like the oldest person there, but my parents just didn't know what to do with me anymore. Graduated high school um, from one of those residential treatment centers, and then I went out to Worcester, Massachusetts for a writing internship. I had always been getting writing published throughout the whole time. I got some stuff published when I was in high school and even before that. I went out to this writing internship out in Boston, or Worcester, which is right outside of Boston, Massachusetts, and that's where I started shooting heroin for the first time. The first time I shot heroin I was 18 and it was in Worcester, Massachusetts. That's a really fast progression, like so you essentially grew up on some substance. You were always doing something from nine to now we're 18 and we're shooting heroin. You know, like more lately, um, I've kind of been looking back, trying to f make sense of what went wrong um, because I had a really happy childhood. You know, there was no abuse or anything. My parents have been happily married for 40 years now. Um, I'm an only child. I look back on all of it and I think that what happened is I had really bad ADD and my parents put me on Ritalin when I was five. Mm -hmm. So basically I'm taking an amphetamine salt when I'm five years old. And I think what happened is neurologically, um, it kind of warped some of my neurological makeup. I think that that's how that progression of substance abuse occurred, you know? And once I got to high school, now you're in a socially acceptable um, part of addiction. You know, it, there's not a lot of consequences, or at least seemingly so, when you're in high school, and I think that's how that escalation occurred. At what point did you realize that this was getting out of hand, and you needed help, or that you were a full-blown addict? I think that when I started getting expelled from high schools, I knew that... I, I didn't look at it as a drug problem, I looked at it more as of a behavioral issue. I don't, I don't really know what what I thought of it back then, but I think the first time that I truly, like, admitted to myself that I was a drug addict was probably a lot later than that. I, was, I think I was like 19. Um, you know, I'm covered in track marks. Um, I'm on the run from the law at the time. And just a lot of bad stuff had started happening. And as much as I wanted to get off heroin, at that point I realized that I couldn't by myself. And I think that's the first time that I realized that I was a drug addict. And that started a long period. I'm 35 now. When I was 19, I started going to treatment voluntarily and I've been in and out ever since. So the first time you went to prison, talk to me a little bit about that. When I was 23, 
I, or well, when I was like 22, I'd already been in and out of rehab. I'd probably been to like 10 rehabs by that point. My parents were spending my college education on treatment. And instead of paying for me to go to college, they just started putting me at like high-end treatment centers. When I was like 22, I'd been kicked out of so many. My parents just were like, we're not gonna put you in treatment anymore. And I always looked at it as almost like a vacation, you know? I'd be like in these really hardcore grimy situations and motels and weird street stuff's happening. And then I'd be on a plane and I'd be in Miami and I'd be getting like mud baths and shit with these people. So to me, I, I don't know if I really associated with what I was doing with like severe consequences at that point. But at 22, I was out of options. So I started selling drugs and I started selling them on a pretty big level. I mean, I was making about 10 grand a week and I was selling kilos of MDMA and I was selling, started selling pounds of heroin. I never got into it um, to intentionally sell heroin. It was kind of like a de facto thing. It was just, as I started bringing in more money, my habits started increasing exponentially. So I had to accommodate that, you know, with more heroin. So I just started selling it so that I could take care of my habit. I mean, there was a point where I was doing about 11 grams of black tar out here a day. I mean, you know, if you were gonna quantify that on uh, like, Find it, you know, uh, probably be, I don't know, three, four hundred dollars worth of heroin a day that I was doing at that time. So it was never about making money. It was just to sustain my habit. And the feds found out what I was doing. The, actually, the way that I got set up is the person that was selling it to me, my connection had gotten caught with a kilo of heroin. And I think a lot of people have like a misconception about how it works, at least on the federal level, because I think a lot of times, you know, in popular culture, you see somebody get busted, like a little snot nosed junkie on the street and they tell them they're a drug dealer. It's the complete opposite on the federal side because they're making these huge sensationalized conspiracies. So it's kind of works backwards. They get the drug dealer and then they ask them where those drugs were going. So they came to me, I was like a smaller person than her. They were trying to get me to tell on the people that I was giving it to. I was only selling a couple pounds of heroin a week at that point. She was much bigger than me, but I didn't cooperate on my case. So it ended with me. Um, and I ended up getting five years in federal prison for that, for 229 grams is what I got caught with. And probably like the hardest part of that situation was I got arrested with my girlfriend. I was with this girl for like two or three years. We both got arrested with the dope. And when you catch a federal case, sometimes they arrest you and just let you go because they want to get that arrest on paper so they can present it to a, a grand jury and, and give you a federal indictment. About six months after I got arrested, I got arrested a couple times. Six months after that, I get a call from the DEA and they told me that I'd been indicted federally and I was facing 10 years in federal prison. I called my attorney and I let him know what was going on and he said, let's try to make a deal with them. We'll tell them that if you surrender, turn yourself in, they, they won't indict your girlfriend. So I did that and I went and voluntarily took myself to the federal building in downtown LA, surrendered to the US Marshals and I didn't come out for five years. And what happened is about three, four months after that, they didn't go after my girlfriend federally, but they pursued it on a state level. So they tricked me. You know, I signed a deal with them that they wouldn't arrest her, but they ended up giving the case to the state level. So she became a fugitive and she died of an overdose um, while she was on the run, you know, scared because they had tricked her. And you know, she thought she was in the clear for it. She ended up going out to Las Vegas and she ended up dying a fugitive. So that was probably the hardest part of that whole situation. I mean, obviously dealing with that kind of time, I was mentally prepared to do 10 years. I ultimately got five. Um, I was coming off 180 milligrams of methadone. So that took like almost six months to kick. And then her dying, you know, it was just a confluence of really fucked up stuff all at the same time. Just to back up a little bit, I think on prison YouTube, we hear a lot that people don't cooperate and they don't snitch and I don't think the general public, one, understands the amount of pressure that you're under when you're arrested, and two, why it is that we don't. You know, I think um, <clears throat> I think that it's just important just to mention here quickly because 
when we're, when we're out there, when we're selling drugs, we know it's not a matter of if, it's when. It's when we go to prison, you know? And you can either take responsibility and do your own time, or you can rat on everyone that you know. I think there are certain, like, famous people, like Takashi, that have made a whole career on snitching. Young people that have never been in that lifestyle can rationalize it when explained by someone that they look up to, right? But the reality of that is so much <laughs> There's like a snitch culture now. <laughs> snitch culture, yeah. You know, I didn't, I'm not a police officer, I'm not a DEA agent, I'm not, I don't work for them. I didn't take a vow to get drugs off the street. I can just remove myself from that situation. So I just kind of wanted to explain that a little bit. And I think, you know, it's admirable that you did your own time. And it's hard as hell. And you lost your girlfriend in the middle of that. So did, um, did your family write you and tell you that she was gone? Or how did you find out? No, um, her brother was the one that had told me. And, you know, it. what's interesting, just to go back on snitching for a second, <laughs> it's just such a great subject. No, it um, is. <laughs> The first time I met with my, so my attorney was this guy named um, Robert Sanger. He represented Michael Jackson. He was top dog attorney. I had money at the time because I was selling drugs. And then my parents like helped me pay like the last of those legal fees. But first time I met with him, he was like, look, cooperating, snitching with law enforcement is against my religion. If, oh, wow. if you want to do that, I'm not even going to represent you. So it was you know, I mean, how often do you run into an attorney like that? It was pretty, you know, that's the first thing he ever said to me. Um, and nowadays, I'd say that, I don't know, there's probably high 90% of people that go sideways on their case like that, if I had to guess. You know, it's a combination of things. The intimidating factor, you're scared, they threaten you with a lot of time. So cool. But <laughs> I, I can't. I can't do that, you know? Um, I had, in my, we're not here to talk about me, but I had people, um, DTF agents, drug task force agents, come at me five or six different times the last time I was arrested because they were trying to get my connect too. And they knew I was pregnant and they used that against me or they tried to manipulate that situation. You know, and it's a hard pill to swallow, but I knew what I was doing. I'm gonna do my own time. It's not my job to get you know, drugs. It's very the respectable. Yeah, and they, they always play on that. They want to strike personal chords. You're pregnant. You know, you're selfish for not. You know, but help us. Help us help you. Yeah. <laughs> help us help you get stabbed in prison. Um, and that's another thing. You you cooperate on your case. See, the thing about federal prison, there's not protective custody. So they throw you all in general population. If you told on your case. There's no protection. There's paperwork that's going to say one way or the other what the truth is. It's all there. You can very easily find out if someone snitched, especially at the federal level. Yeah, you can uh, run their dockets. Um, but yeah, anyway. I watched someone snitch in federal court. <laughs> I watched it and I just was blown away. They read the transcript of snitching and everything. It was crazy. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's, that's one thing that helped me get away from that whole world is just like realizing that none of the friendships that I thought that I had in that world were genuine. It was just a bunch of disingenuous people. There's no honor among thieves anymore. And that's absolutely true. You know, just, just a cutthroat world. That wasn't the only time you went to prison. That wasn't the only time that I went to prison. So, um, you know, I was using drugs while I was in there. Um, federal prisons flooded with heroin. And I was pretty much using the first few years that I was in there, maybe the first four years, you know, mm -hmm. almost all of the time, sharing needles with people, you know, not caring about possibly contracting HIV. I thank God I like dodged that bullet somehow, but um, I just didn't care. The atmosphere was so gloomy in there. I just wanted to escape any way that I could. So I was shooting heroin in federal prison for years. And then what happened at the end is somebody had set me up in like someone just came up to me and, and asked me they're like hey do you do you still do heroin i was like yeah and he, so he ended up giving me some an hour later the lieutenant called me in and drug tested me he set me up you know and that's I mean, that's a red flag right there you don't, you don't get free drugs in prison <laughs> i didn't even know this guy but like i i knew people that knew him and i'm such a dope fiend that i'm just like oh okay free drugs right they end up putting me in solitary confinement um, for 60 days. They took, I had no books, I had no music. I was literally in an eight by 10 cell by myself for 60 days. And during that time, um, my grandfather died and they like brought me, like I was like handcuffed and shackled and they brought me into a room and let me know that he'd passed away. 
I was so, I'd been on drugs at that point for like over a decade. So that was my coping mechanism for everything. My socialization had all been around doing drugs. And I had to just sit in that cell in my own shit for like, you know, another 30, 40, it was 60 days altogether. I think that happened like the second week that I was in there. And I had this profound cathartic breakdown and I was just like, I'm because, you know, solitary confinement's like being in jail in prison. So I'm yeah. like, I'm in jail in prison for the same thing that I'm in prison to begin with, you know, and my entire life is going to look like this if I don't stop doing it. So I made a vow to myself to get sober and I stayed good for three years after that. I got out a year um, after that time that I had gotten set up for the heroin in there. I got out with the year sober under my belt. Like I didn't, I didn't smoke weed. I was a hundred percent sober. Um, and while I was in prison, I wrote my book, Wasting Talent, and it got published right when I got out. My life was like perfect. I was sober. I was in the best shape of my life. Had a book that just came out. It seemed like everybody that had kind of given up hope on me before that had this like newfound respect for me, you know, like I had conquered adversity. Like I remember how emotional it was when I got a year sober on Facebook. I mean, there were people that had written me off that, that forgave me. And so I got sober, book came out, I started touring, you know, everything just seemed like it was going perfect. And I ended up relapsing about a week before my three year sober mark. Um, I was engaged to a girl at the time and um, her dad was dying of cirrhosis of the liver from hepatitis C. I have hepatitis C. Um, she went out to the East Coast to go be with him while he was on his deathbed and I relapsed. I don't know. I just, we had been together, you know, I had like separation anxiety. We were super codependent, toxic relationship. I'd never been away from her in like two years and when she left, I just went out, you know, and I relapsed and I lost everything within a week. Like she took every, she took the condo, she left me. We've been together two years, we we're engaged. And from that point in 2015, so I got out in 2013 after doing five years. From 2015 until, you know, recently, I've been in and out of rehabs and in jail again. And I ended up getting a fan letter from a girl for my book. Um, for wasting talent. She was a single mom in Denver and I just sold the French rights to it. So I had, I like, I was surf couching at the time. I was living on my friend's couch and I just got like six grand. For me, that was like a lot of money at the time. And I just met this girl, she sent me a fan letter and I ended up flying her out to LA to party with me. I didn't realize she was a single mom. I didn't really know much about her. We just kind of had this drug fueled weekend and we were at a bar the following Monday and some lady was like, Oh my God, you guys are such a cute couple. And my husband officiates weddings. You should get married. And we were all coked out. We we're like, yeah, oh it sounds God. like a great idea. And so we ended up getting married. Like I will, I remember waking up and it all seemed like it didn't actually happen, but I was really married to her. Come to find out that she was, um, not who she really presented herself to be. And, we just had this really horrible, tumultuous relationship for a year. And the end of that, I, you know, I, I was on heroin the whole marriage and I was drinking two fifths of whiskey a day. Like I was physically dependent to it at that point. You know, I remember she's like, I want you to meet my kid, but I, you're always drunk. Can you not drink today? And I was so naive to alcohol dependency. I didn't know that after drinking two fists of whiskey a day for like over a year like that, that I was physically dependent to it. So I just didn't drink that day. And I remember the whole bed just started shaking. It was like mm. being in the exorcist. Like I, I was getting delirium tremens for the first time in my life. I'd never had them before. And that's when I realized like how fucked I was on alcohol. Like I was completely physically dependent to it. Um, and at the end of that marriage, I ended up uh, getting arrested for a DUI. I blew a 0 0.06, the legal limit's a 0.08. I was, I was text messaging someone in LA. I was on the freeway. I was about text messaging her. It was her son's birthday. And I was like, I'm going to buy him a skateboard, but I was really going to meet my connection to get heroin. And as I was responding to the text message, I looked up, I was on the freeway 
and all the traffic had stopped. So I went to slam on the brakes and I ended up hitting a car and that car hit another car. So I totaled the one in the middle. They arrested me for DUI, even though I wasn't drunk, I just had a little bit of alcohol in my system and uh, the feds ended up sending me back to prison, not jail, they sent me to federal prison um, for 90 days, which isn't a long time, but it's enough time to completely dismantle your life. Like I lost my apartment, I lost my car, I met Big Meech, that was the only cool thing about it. <laughs> like, you know, I just happened to be at Lompoc with him the same time that he was there. Um, and then I got out and then um, I caught another case. Right around that time period, um, I sold the rights to my book. To you know, I sold it to the guy that had written and produced the movie Spun. I don't know if you've seen that, but it's a movie with Brittany Murphy and Mickey Rourke. I've been trying to sell the film rights to it for a long time. At that point, my book was like doing okay but it wasn't doing great. It hadn't hit any bestseller lists yet. Soon as he got the rights to it, it's called an option, I started getting a bunch of press. Like I got in Huffington Post, Penthouse did like a 10 page article about me. My name was on the cover. Um, all these different magazines, The Independent, my local newspaper, and it just catapulted my, my book up to the bestseller list. Now I just caught a new case. I was out on bail. Um, now that's a whole another thing, but um, I met the girl that I'm with now during that time and I ended up getting her pregnant like immediately. I was out on bail for the latest case that I was, that I, that I got. I just got this film deal and then my friend Jim Oles who wrote the screenplay for the movie Fight Club, he's like one of my closest friends and he was like mentoring me, teaching me how to write screenplays and he's like, so you just caught a new case, you just got a film deal and you have a baby on the way? He's like, we should make a documentary about you. And so we started filming a documentary that went into production 2017. So at the end there, I ended up having an emotional breakdown. It was just too much shit. You know, it was like thinking about missing the birth of my kid, knowing that I was going back to prison. They were talking about years. They were talking like four or five years. I had no idea what I was going to get. And then out of nowhere, I just started getting press. Like nobody cared about me before that. And then out of nowhere, like my name's showing up everywhere. And all of a sudden I have a bunch of followers on social media accounts and it just kind of happened a little too quickly. And so I had this really embarrassing public breakdown where I was like going on Facebook Live and I was like, there's helicopters chasing me, the feds are trying to silence me. Now everybody assumed that I was on meth, you know? They were like, look man, uh, <laughs> you're all twacked out again. I was like, no, you know, but nobody trusted me. Taking that, eat a sandwich, man. <laughs> and what was interesting is I was staying up for a week at a time because I was so stressed out. It was just a legitimate physical response to stress. Mm -hmm. But it looked like all the symptoms of meth psychosis. So yeah. everybody thought that. Meth know? psychosis has a lot to do with not only the chemicals, but sleep deprivation. So yeah. you really can go crazy with just lack of sleep. Yeah, and I, and, and I did. And so eventually my PO ended up issuing a warrant and I went and I did 16 months um, on this last term that I did. Um, and that really humbled me, you know, because a lot of that stuff like started going to my head, you know, and I started getting really narcissistic and it just, I, my ego blew up. So, I, and then you go back to county jail, like, you know, you're like, do you know who I am? <laughs> to people and be like, shut the fuck up. And you know, and they, so they ended up, I ended up getting jumped like the first week I was in there because I thought I can't, I thought I was like Tom Cruise or something. Like, you know, I was like, I have all this shit going for me. and. Um, I got three broken ribs. I was on Suboxone, so I had to kick Suboxone cold turkey with three broken ribs. And then the last term I was on was just nightmarish. I mean, I got in 12 riots in a 16 month period. At that time, California state prison was going through huge, devastating changes. What they were doing is mixing protective custody with general population. <sighs> So it didn't matter what fucking sides you were on, every time you went to the cafeteria, every time you went to the chow hall, you know, the cafeteria where they, where they serve you food, something was cracking off, you know? And uh, it really, it, it, it really affected me more than I think I realized. Mm -hmm. um, I've just started to notice some of those 
lingering effects from it. Like if I'm walking at night, let's just say like on a sidewalk and I see some people grouped up, like I'll, I have like these like intense panic attacks, like where like my shirt will start just sopping wet. Like that's I, like anxiety attacks where I feel like I'm going to die or something. And I've never had anything like that in my history. So it had some really devastating long-term effects. Um, this last term, I mean, probably a cumulative, it's probably from all of the different stuff put together, but this last one was particularly bad for me and missing the birth of my kid. I can't even, words can't even articulate like how deep that pain was. Just knowing that he was alive and that I, he was in the world and that I, I couldn't be there because I wanted to be. Um, and then the first time I met him was in a federal prison visitation room. So, and then um, I ended up getting out uh, back in like 2019 and at first I couldn't really get, it was really hard. I was on, I was on parole. I had no money. My book had like seen its lifespan pretty much. Like seen I was, best days. yeah, I like wasn't really, I was getting like $200 royalty checks and you know, it was not nothing I could support a family on. Now I had a kid. Thankfully my girl, um, stayed with me. You know, she rode the whole term out with me. And you know, I was very fortunate. And also that relationship was like pretty much a drunk fling. Going to prison definitely like bolstered that relationship. We fell in love with each other on that term because we got to know each other. Like we removed the physical aspect out of the relationship and we just connected on more of an emotional front. I'm very grateful for that. And we got out and like had a really strong, healthy relationship. And of course I was very grateful for everything she did for me while I was away. And then, um, we moved back to LA. My parents ended up getting us a place. They're like, all right, we'll get you first and last month's rent. Um, they gave us a car. Like they really looked out, you know, um, gave them their first grandkid and I couldn't get work down here. You know, like, Everywhere I'd go, they'd ask me if I'd been convicted of a felony and I was honest about it. I was like, yeah, but only three. And they're like, <laughs> <laughs> one, one you can explain, mm -hmm. you know, one felony. It's like, I had a drug problem. I'm good. Three over the span of like a 35 year period. Like it just makes you look completely unemployable. Yeah, <laughs> and, no, I, I you look know? like shit on paper too. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, so. I ended up at the end, and then we're done with my story, pretty much. We're well, I mean, at least the questions. oh yes, but the <laughs> the cliff note bullet point presentation yeah. of it. At the end, I ended up getting a job telemarketing. I hated no it. No way! I did that too when I got out. Yeah, that was always that was like my go-to because they'll employ anybody. Yeah. So I I was always at telemarketing rooms. Yeah. And the guy that I worked for was like some guy with like his labret pierced, and he had like he looked like Takashi or something. This guy's like always talking shit to me, and I I don't know. One day I was just like I just couldn't do it, and I was like, you know what? Fuck you, man. And I walked out. And the next day I was on Al Profit show. Um. And I have not worked a day for another person since then. Like my YouTube just took off. I was able to get Patreon. I was able to supplement my income. I sold two screenplays since then. So like basically YouTube and Patreon were like a lifeline that like kept up my family alive. And I was able to keep pursuing my other writing projects. And then I just started hitting, uh, you know, good luck. <laughs> I, I don't think people understand what YouTube or social media can do for people like us. You know, like I've found a purpose through sharing my story and through sharing my story, I know that it is helping other people. That does a lot for me, you know, cause it kind of seems like everything I went through wasn't in vain. You know, like I can not only make a living, that's great, but I can also have a purpose in that. Like all the pain and all the trauma that I went through helps other people. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I get, I get messages all the time and people tell me how much it helps them and it encourages other people that have a felony record that think, because that's one of the biggest problems with that system is that they demean you and you're being told that you're less than for so long that you start to believe it, whether it's the guards in there, not giving you a pillow and treating you like a human or when you're out on parole and they want to like compartmentalize you in this very small little 
worthless corner. I mean, that's how they make you feel. Um, so I think that YouTube and people like us, it's very encouraging for other people because uh, lets people know that they can think outside of the box. You don't have to pursue orthodox employment for, um, you know, to make it. I'm able to support a family of three, soon to be four. Now she's pregnant again. Thank you. Um, just off my YouTube and Patreon. And thankfully I've started selling other scripts as well. One thing that I forgot to mention that was a, a, a huge part of my, my story over the last year or so is last November, I lost my best friend to a heroin overdose. His name was Paul Harper. And um, it was one of those things where I, at the end it was getting, I saw it coming. You know, my documentary went back into production when I got out. One of the first things we did is go and interview Paul. And I'm so grateful that we got that opportunity. We got it on film. And the day that we interviewed him, he didn't want to drink in front of my fiance and I, because she's a really bad alcoholic as well. And she's in recovery. She's been sober since she found out she was pregnant with our first son. Um, and I'm not drinking anymore. I, we've both been off alcohol for years now. Um, but, uh, he ended up taking like 20 clonopins that day because he didn't want to show up drunk, but because he took so many benzos, he was pretty belligerent, probably the worst shape I'd seen him in. He was really pale. And I remember telling Karina, my partner, I was like, I, I don't know. I, it, it looks like he doesn't have much, much more life in him, you know? And I was like, I'd hate to get that phone call. And then I did get that phone call and, um, it was at like eight in the morning. I started getting calls. He was from Monterey. So it was like an 831 area code. Thought it was a telemarketer. And then his fiance called from Facebook messenger. I already knew, um, I already, I just knew at that, you know, that was my best friend. I got him tattooed. You know, out of all the people I've, at this point in my life, I was counting the other day, been to rehab 25 times. I've been to prison three times. I can count on paper, 42 people I know that have died from accidental opiate overdoses. My ex-girlfriend being a rather significant part of that, but Paul, he was, um, you know, one of those people that, like, he genuinely cared about me. You might go your entire life and you might find one or two people like that. He was the kind of guy if, like, he would send me $8 at a time when, when when I was in prison and that's all he had. He didn't have a lot of money, but for him to send that, it was like him sacrificing a pack of cigarettes for the day. And it meant more to me than somebody that yeah. sent more money because he, he cared that much, like where he'd be willing to sacrifice for me just to look out. He'd, oh, he'd write me every day. I'd be in the hole and I'd be getting, you know, letters, pictures from him all the time. He always, he, he cared about me. So after he died, um, obviously it took a long time to, recover from that emotionally. But, um, I started a nonprofit called the Paul project to try to give Narcan to people for free nationally, because when you overdose, there's that small window where you go into respiratory arrest. The paramedic said if they had come like maybe 15 minutes sooner that he did, he would still be alive. If there was Narcan in that house, when he's in that window with the respiratory arrest, then you can correct that accidental overdose and Paul would still be with us. So, I know that um, that he would definitely like that I'm doing that for him. You know, he was one of those people that always was trying to help other people. And last thing I'll say with him is he was instrumental in getting me sober the first time. I'd go to meetings and I'd feel like people that were sharing weren't legitimately alcoholic or weren't legitimately f dealing with this like com this compulsory thing that I that had been ruining my life for so long and I literally had no control over and I'd feel like people would be like, well, I, you know, I went to my first meeting and oh, now I'm sober and I own a ranch in Dallas or, you know, and you're yeah. just like, you just couldn't relate to them. They were unrelatable. And, um, with Paul, I knew how bad he was. He was a severe addict. He got sober like three years before I did. So we had like three years when I decided to get clean and he stayed clean for five years. He was always one of those guys that lived with a girlfriend, always had a girlfriend taking care of him. He never had a job, he never had a car, he never had shit. When he got sober, he had his own apartment, he had a car, 
you know, he had, he was engaged to an accountant, a normal person. Um, he was sponsoring people. He had five years sober and what had happened with him and why his story is so tragic is he went to go get a root canal and he told the dentist, he said, do not give me opiates. I'm a junkie. I cannot have opiates. I can't have opioid painkillers. Dentist said, I don't want to have a dental emergency in the middle of the night. Here's Percocet. No. Have your girlfriend give it to you. He told him no. And that was five years, four years before he died. And he never could get more than a week sober after that. Like it just, he lost everything. And, uh, you know, looking back on that, it's, it's just a really trap. His whole, his whole situation is really, really sad. Well, I think it's amazing that you started a nonprofit specifically based around Narcan. Um, you know, I, I get a lot of criticism when I talk about Narcan because people don't understand. They think that it is enabling, but it's a life-saving measure and I wouldn't be here without Narcan. I've overdosed and was given Narcan. Um, and the fact that it's not readily available and the fact that people, you know, have anything negative to say about it is terrible. I'll combat that forever. So what you're doing is great. Yeah, it's that weird kind of draconian old more on drug dinosaur outlook right. where like, hey, if, if we have needle exchanges, it is endorsing drug use. It's making, people are going to use drugs anyway. You know, it's, it's harm reduction. It's harm reduction. So if you're reducing the amount of harm that a person is doing, you know, they have clean needles and access to Narcan while simultaneously giving them information for treatment and opening that door for them, then eventually, hopefully that light bulb will click and they'll reach out for that help. Absolutely. It's, it's, um, there was this book I read when I was in prison this last time. It was called Chasing the Scream. Have you ever heard of that book? Have it you sounds read really it? familiar. So that book was, it was about this guy, um, his boyfriend in Europe was a crackhead and he couldn't figure out why his boyfriend was addicted to drugs. Like he just couldn't understand the disease. It, yeah. it, it, it boggled his mind. So he went around the world looking at different drug laws and trying to figure out what was going on with the war on drugs. And he did a lot of, you know, empirical observation. And what he had said, which very interesting, is Portugal, where they had decriminalized drugs and parts of Toronto, you know, there's other parts of Canada where it's decriminalized or where the the, the laws have been liberalized safe to a degree. Or safe injection sites mm -hmm. and things like that in yeah, Toronto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Canada, the safe injection sites. And what he was saying is, if you look at it statistically, the places where they've liberalized the drug laws or decriminalized it, the recovery rates are much higher mm -hmm. because when you remove the criminality element out of the picture, it help it, it it doesn't keep people in the cycle of social immobility. When there's a criminal aspect involved, you get in this little trap and you're just in this revolving door and it's almost impossible to juggle it all for a lot of people. In places like Portugal, Toronto, places like that, they've actually found that recovery rates have spiked once they start decriminalizing drugs. And that's paradoxical. People always think, oh, if you legalize all drugs, like they just, you know, if they decriminalize it like they did in, in Oregon, everyone's going to start smoking crack. Nobody <laughs> is going to start smoking crack that's not doing that right now because yeah. it's decriminalized. It's just, it's just not, it's just not reality. You know, um, you look at places where marijuana has been legalized or decriminalized, use has not gone up. It's the same. Uh, it's about harm reduction, like Jessica said. I, I completely agree with you there. So you had to go to maximum security prisons yeah. in California? California, I did, I was at level three, level, I was at a level three, I was at a level one, you know, um, when I was in federal prison, I've been to just the mediums and Lompoc's at USP. So that's like a three and four. So you did a lot of time in prison in California and the Midwest. So I just, I really want to hear a prison story. All right, I'm gonna, I'll tell you the, the two worst things that I saw in prison. The first one happened when I was at FCI Victorville in California. And the way that it works in federal prison is you don't have TVs in your cell. They put them up on a podium or they have TV rooms. So what happens when there's like public televisions like that is there's a lot of problems that mm -hmm. surround the television. As silly as that sounds, people fight over control of what's going to be watched or whatever. The whites have a TV, blacks have a TV, Southsiders, um, and you know, all the different races have their own TV. So I'm sitting down one day and I'm watching television at the white 
section. That's how racially segregated it is in, in prison in California. I was in federal prison there. Um, and I'm sitting there with this guy. Somebody comes up and just changes the channel mm. without asking. Mm -mm. Now, the guy that had changed the channel was, was tall. He was probably like 6'4". The guy that was sitting there with me was like my size, like 5'6", five, 5'7", five, but stocky. They started fighting. And they get in this like really bad fight. I'm just sitting there and like I'd already learned my lesson not to get involved. Like when like I'm one of those people that be like, come on guys, you know, no more fighting. You don't want to do that in prison. People get really upset about that. So I just kind of like let the fight continue. And this tall guy got beat up really badly by this short stocky guy. He was embarrassed about it. And got like a black eye. He was all lumped up. Every prison in the country has a four o'clock stand-up count where everybody has to go in their cell. Guards will come and do their rounds. It takes about an hour. So we all go to our cells after the fight. The guards didn't see it. When we come back out, the short guy, I mean the tall guy, went to the microwave and he put baby oil in a cup. Oh my God. And he put it in the microwave for long enough for it to boil. So it's like the simmering hot baby oil that was in a cup. The guy that had beat him up, the guy that was my size, the stocky guy, he's playing pinochle with some South Siders. They're sitting at a table, they're just playing cards. He goes up to him taps him on the back and he turns around and he mm. pours the mug with the boiling hot baby oil in, in his face. It's the kind of thing where like his face just turned flush white. So it didn't look so bad right in the beginning, but he was screaming. It was this hellacious scream just kind of reverberated throughout the entire housing unit. It's the kind of shriek that you'll never forget. Yeah. It's like what nightmares are made out of. And then his skin, it almost looked like it was melting off and his eyeball started dangling out like a, like a, almost like an earring. Oh like it, it looked like a teardrop, but it was his eyeball. It was like something you'd see in a horror movie. And I saw that, like I saw that with my own eyes. It was incredibly traumatizing. That was the second worst thing that I've seen in prison. The first, the worst thing that I ever saw. So. In California, um, you know, with the politics and everything, there's always going to be somebody that runs the different races, the shot caller. Pecker Woods are just kind of like your standard white guy. That's me. And then you've got skinheads with swastikas emblazoned all over them. They're not one and the same. Skinheads are usually on their own program doing their own thing but we all kind of come together because of the big racial things just because of the numbers once in a while in federal prison the shot caller for the whites will be a skinhead it's always bad when it's a skinhead they're just they always kind of rule with an iron fist so there is this guy that had become the shot caller for the whites when i was this is again at victorville he was one of these guys that just got off on violence. You know, I'm the kind of guy, like, if I'm at a bar and somebody starts fighting, I don't want to look at it because it nauseates me. Like, I don't like seeing violence in real life. In movies, it's whatever. But in person, I don't like watching fights. I just don't like violence. This is the kind of guy that, like, it's almost like a sexual gratification that he gets from violence. So he started running the yard, and he kind of made it known that he was going to... Um, make examples out of people. Around that time, there was this kid from Texas that was making hooch. He's actually making white lightning. So it's like prison pruno or hooch, but you end up getting a stinger. You know, you stick a cord inside of the wine that's fermenting and you take the perspiration out of it and that's clear alcohol. It's, like, it's moonshine, I mean, it's white lightning is what they call mm -hmm. it. That's a big hustle in there, but it's loud. You know, because you have to plug this cord into a bag and it just reeks. It smells like a brewery, literally. So this kid ends up getting caught making alcohol. 
send them to the hole. I think you do like 30 days. This happened before this new guy started running the yard. So the lieutenant goes to take this guy out of the hole and they always say standard, hey, do you owe any money out on the yard? Are you cool to go back to general population? Are you, is it okay if we put you back on the yard? It's like, I don't want to go back to the yard. Fuck that yard. It's run by a bunch of drug addicts and bitches. Lieutenant's like, all right, well, you're going back to the drug addicts and bitches. Yeah. <laughs> we don't care. Well, what happened is somebody heard him call the entire yard bitches. Now, that's a word that you just don't say in prison. You don't say punk or bitch. Universally. I've done time all over the country. I've seen more people get stabbed over those two words than anything else in prison. Even more so than deaths. Just over those words. Those are automatic fighting words. In prisons like Victorville, that's automatic. You're getting stabbed over it. So, you can get messages back to the yard when they take your trays. You can put a little piece of paper called a kite in your tray. It goes to the kitchen and the kitchen workers know that this is coming from the hole. They'll look at the trays for little notes. They got a message to the guy that was running the whites at the time and they said, hey, this guy that just got released just called all you guys bitches. I hope you don't let him just get away with that like that. He got out of the hole like on probably like a Wednesday. We knew that this guy was going to get hit, killed. That's what was going around the prison. They're like, We're, that guy's going to get killed over that. Just for saying that. On Saturdays at Victorville at that time, and by the way, it's nicknamed Victimville because so much brutality goes on at this place. At that time, on Saturdays, the whites would make you go to mandatory yard. You'd have to go to yard Saturday night because if you owed money, if you were doing things that you weren't supposed to be doing, that's when you got dealt with. So you had to face the music every sat. So pretty much every Saturday at that prison, you knew you were going to see something very violent happen on Saturday night. This particular Saturday, we knew that this guy was the target and he was going to get hit. So we went out that night and they asked me, they're like, hey, do you want to be on the squad? Like, we want you to stab him. I'd already done stuff like that. You know, I was like, eh, see if somebody else will raise their hand. And thankfully somebody, you know, young kids are always volunteering because they want to like prove themselves to the older guys. Thankfully, I got to sit out on that. I was at the yard smoking a joint. I was just sitting there with some of my friends smoking. We knew this guy was going to get hit. He was wearing like all gray sweatpants. The entire yard's looking at this guy. Like every race knows that this particular guy is going to get hit. I don't know how he didn't know. He must not have had any friends or anything. Because that happens sometimes. They'll like, your friends will warn you, like, hey, you're about to get whacked right now. So we see him walk across the yard, and somebody, like a young, probably like 20 year old, goes up and just punches him in the face. So he falls down, and they issue you black work boots in the feds. So everybody wears those out when you go to mandatory yard like that. These are like really thick, heavy work boots. After he falls on the ground, everybody just starts stomping on his face. Now this is like completely standard protocol. Smash you off the yard, that's it. So you're seeing him like get bloodied up. But this kid that had punched it, the first guy that had punched him took out a knife and he just started butchering this guy. He stabbed him so many times that I think his hand started cramping up. I mean, he, I don't, who knows how many times he stabbed him, but these are pretty superficial wounds. Like these makeshift prison shanks are not like a hunting knife. You know, they're like little slivers of like, I don't know, sheet metal, you know, they're not, they, they, but they make little holes in you. So you bleed a lot, but it, it's hard to die off of them. So they beat him up, stab him a bunch of times. And then the guy that was running the yard comes out like Darth Vader or something. Like he like walks out, everybody's watching him. And he goes up to this guy, this guy, this kid that had just gotten stabbed a bunch of times, jumped. He had hair like a little bit longer than me. This guy grabs him by the hair and like holds it up like this. Now the guy's crying. He's like, he's begging for his life. And this guy that was running the yard took this little razor blade. It's like probably like that big. People use it to like cut up vegetables. You're not allowed to have it. It's like contraband, but he had it. He's like, this is what happens when you call everybody a bitch. He's like, this shows you, you know, that we're not bitches on this yard, whatever crazy shit he was saying. And he just starts cutting the guy from the top of his head all the way to his chin. 
and you just keep slicing them and slicing them with this thin razor. Again, kind of like when the guy got burned, when you get like a severe cut on your face like that, it takes a while for it to start bleeding. Like it doesn't just start bleeding right away, but when it started bleeding, blood was like cascading down his face. Like it looked like something gory you'd see in like a Vietnam movie. Or it was so hard. It was, it was, it like made me want to vomit. Like that's how disturbing that imagery was. Just seeing this blood just like pour out of the, and he was just like wobbling and he fell down. So I, I don't think people fully understand, unless you've gone through it, the magnitude of PTSD that you have from things like that. Not only are you in survival mode every single day that you're in prison, but when you're constantly seeing people beat up and stabbed and their face is melted off. I've seen something similar, but not as grotesque with the face melting. It does something to you. And you know, there isn't, there isn't uh, a class in prison where they're like, we're gonna help you through PTSD. This is what is going to happen. This is how you, you know. No, they just push you out into the free world, and you have to deal with it on your own. You know. So, how how did you transition from going to Victorville into the free world? I mean, was that challenging? Yeah. You know, I obviously I had underlying mental health stuff yeah. before that. Um, I don't know ADD or ADD and bipolar look very similar. Whatever the case was it definitely was exasperated by all the shit that I went through in prison. And I think that it affected me most in my relationships with women. Before I went to prison, I was always like a pretty like jealous kind of guy, you know, insecure. I've gotten a lot better now. Like I'm probably in the first healthy relationship I've ever been in or like I'm, I don't trip on her. I just know that she loves me. I mean, she wrote a term out with me and I think that's, like I was saying earlier, like it really showed me that she cared about me. But before her, um, I was jealous, you know, controlling whatever stuff that existed before prison, before I like really found an opportunity to heal, which was after all this. But what prison did do to me, what the PTSD did, and I think maybe being in solitary confinement and being exposed to all the bad imagery, is I had like debilitating separation anxiety where I couldn't be away from somebody that I was dating, like at all. I, I would go into like severe panics and it was definitely like now in retrospect, that was undealt with PTSD. Like it was, this intense, irrational fear that the person was gonna leave me if like they were out of my sight because I was so used to like my entire world being taken away from me instantly so many times in there. On top of that, all the violence that I saw like accentuated those fears because um, you know, when you grow up, like I grew up in Santa Barbara, California, like upper middle class in a little insulated bubble where like nothing bad ever happens. Like you see someone get beat up at a keg party, it's about the worst thing you're gonna see. <laughs> Violence is abstract concept at that point. It's completely abstracted. When you see it like in horror movies or what, you're just like, like it doesn't, see, it does not seem real. Once you start experiencing brutality on like a real level like that, you get a very real understanding of what the human condition's about and there's actually a dark evil side to it and it's it's so it's a weird balance because you're scared because you know the potentiality of what can happen but you have to kind of try to base yourself back in reality that it's probably not something bad's probably not going to happen to you every time you leave your house. The odds are a lot different being in prison than they are out here. So it's a really tough transition, like having to convince yourself that every time you leave your house, there's not a high probability that somebody's going to stab you in the back of the head with a screwdriver or something. When you're in prison, when you leave your cell, that's what you're thinking. So you have to transition from like, I'm leaving my house, which is your cell something bad might happen to you can fucking relax now you know like you don't have to sleep with your shoes on or whatever you do in prison to make yourself feel a little bit better and that's hard yeah to change sleep, that sleep with your shoes on and um like you know we used to put rolled up magazines in our waistline because then you have armor if somebody tries to stab you like 
if we knew that there was something racial that had been brewing, like if we were gonna go at it with black guys or something, we would all put rolled up magazines in our waistline so that if we were gonna get hit or something, it would it would be cushioned by that. Right. So like having to get out to the real world where every time you leave your apartment or whatever, that's, I don't know. I, I'm trying to explain it, but it's like trying to root yourself back in reality, yeah. I guess is like, because you know that bad things can happen. It's no longer just a rumor at that point, you know? Like before you're like, oh shit, like you see on the news, you're like, well, somebody got stabbed at a gas station, that's hardcore. Well, at least it wasn't me, it probably won't happen to me ever. But then you go to prison, you see it happen so often, mm -hmm. you start thinking that, that it is a high possibility that something like that's gonna happen to you. In reality, you have to adjust yourself back to what it actually is. It's, it's, it's like a really weird, calibration you know like getting centered again and like not living in hyper paranoia anymore so how long have you been out this last time um i got out march 25th 2019 so i have been out almost two years now so it's pretty amazing in just two years everything that you've done you're friends with Johnny Depp now, and I want to call him from your phone. <laughs> Hi, Johnny. It's Jessica. How's it going? Um, that is cool, actually. You, know, The craziest thing about that, I, I have to say, this is the, probably one of the coolest things that's ever happened to me in my life. My first tattoo was the cover of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, right? Oh, wow. That's awesome. And so when I met him, I got called by a mutual friend, and he's like, hey, Johnny read your book. He's interested in you. I would die. And he wants to meet you. I was working at the telemarketing place with the guy with the fucking LeBray pierced. Yeah. I was like, can I go to Johnny's house? And he's like, no, can I go to <laughs> get house? back to your computer, you know? <laughs> it was actually the day after I quit is when that happened. It was like the universe telling me like, yeah. all right, you did the right thing. So um, I go up to his house, right? And with our mutual friend and he's nice and everything. He's like, I've heard so much about you. I'm like, all right, you know, I can do a better Johnny. He's like, hey man, uh, <laughs> I've heard so much about you. I was like, oh, yeah, I've heard so much about you, Johnny. He starts talking to his sister and these other people and like out of nowhere, I don't know why, but I got I got like all ballsy. I was like, hey, Johnny, you wanna see my first tattoo? And like everybody was like, oh my God, like you interrupted the king, like what's, you know? And he's like, he's like what's that, man? And I was like, look, Your and face. I showed him the fear and loathing tattoo. And he like hugged me, he's like, thanks brother. And later that, so on that tattoo, that's of Johnny playing Hunter S. Thompson, but this is really Johnny. So I've always had a tattoo of Johnny Depp. That's kind of weird, but there's this <laughs> cigarette holder that Hunter S. Thompson has. So that night I'm hanging out with Johnny for the first time I met him. He comes up to me. He's like, Hey man, I have a present for you. And he opens his, he, he opens his hand and drops Hunter's cigarette holder <gasps> in my hand. Just think about that for a second. This tattoo that I got when I was 17, I have that, I own that now. The actual cigarette, like it manifested into a physical thing. That was like, the, and I know it sounds corny, but like that was honestly like the moment, aside from seeing my child for the first time, that was like a moment in my life where I was like, wow, dreams coming true, like right at the second. That's not corny. If anyone laughs at you for that, I will punch them in the face. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I thought it was cool. I don't know. I mean, and so I have that. I think I'm going to make a necklace out of it too. I think I'm going to like wear it. But that's like the moment where, cause I spent so many nights in prison, like dreaming that stuff like that would happen that like I was writing this book and that was on top of just writing it. It was kind of like a daydream to like, the better life that it might be able to provide for me. It took a really long time for that fantasy to kind of start happening and become reality. But that moment where he handed me that was definitely when like, I was like, all right, it's getting, it's getting real right now, you know? And uh, I don't know, I just think that's cool. Like my cigarette came to life, I mean, my <laughs> tattoo came to life on me. And uh, I don't know. You know, like I was an addict for a decade, you know, and I felt like it was gonna take me a lifetime to even be stable, but you know, addicts are usually natural born hustlers and it's amazing how fast we can get on our feet and great things start to happen when you do get sober and you're a living testament to that and I'm so proud of you and I can't wait to see everything else that you have to do. 
I'm a big fan now. Oh, I really appreciate <laughs> that. I, like in the beginning of YouTube, I was watching her videos and I commented, I'm like, can I come on your show? And look, hold on, to. hold on, hold on. I've it's been in it. No. I've been in it for a long time, so I get it now. Like it's, I've been doing this like a year and a half. You don't know. I don't even read the comments anymore. It made me feel so bad. I'm like, you know. But uh, I was like, well, she's too big for me. No. <laughs> uh, all right. But so I'm so like appreciative that I'm sitting here now. You know, after all that time. We have a mutual friend, and he told me five seconds of your story, and I was like, hell yeah, I want to have him on. Dave, oh, yeah. Dopey. Oh, yes. Yeah, so shout out to Dave for making this happen. Thank you, Dave. And, um, you know, free with. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to link all of your stuff down below. Your book, your uh, YouTube, your Instagram, everything that you're doing. And hopefully you can come back on the show in like a year or so, or six months, and you have more stories for us. Well, I'm a new baby. And a new baby. Hopefully. I'm on team. I really want a, a daughter. I'm on team girl right now, but I'll be just happy if it's if it's healthy. You can That's name her Jessica. It is. We <laughs> already, we're already in there. <laughs> Follow him on YouTube for all his crazy stories. What you guys saw just now is a tenth. It's a fraction of what he has to offer. He has stories for days. So you're seriously missing out if you don't subscribe to his channel. I had a really good time and I'm very appreciative that you had me on the show. Thank you to everybody in Jessica land. <laughs> I appreciate you too. All right, you guys. Thank you so much for watching. As always, I love you. Stay safe, stay sober, whatever that looks like to you. And I'll see you in the next one.